everyone. I'm Patty Carollo, and welcome to Talks at Google. It's an honor for me to be here today with our guest, Candace Nelson. Candace is a serial entrepreneur, best-selling author, Wall Street Journal contributor, angel investor, TV star, executive producer, and mom. Candace started her career in investment banking, and in 2005, she left the banking world to launch Sprinkles. Sprinkles is the world's first cook cupcake bakery and cupcake ATM. And in 2012, Candace sold Sprinkles to a private equity firm. And today, Sprinkles has sold over 200 million cupcakes, has over 20 stores, 30 cupcake ATMs, and 1,000 employees. Five years ago, Candace co-founded Pizzana, a chain of neo-Neapolitan pizzerias. And many of you may recognize Candace as one of the judges on Sugar Rush and Cupcake Wars. Today, Candace leads CN2 Ventures, and she just launched a new book called Sweet Success, where she shares her entrepreneurial journey. Candace, I loved your book. I read it and also listened to it on Audible. Um, and it was wonderful to have you as the narrator. It was so great to hear you share the story in your own voice. Uh, and yesterday, as you know, I went to Sprinkles in New York City. I bought a couple dozen cupcakes and we shared them with our customer in New York that flew in from Paris, as well as many happy Googlers. So congratulations and welcome. We're so, so delighted to have you here. Thank you for that wonderful intro. And thank you for serving my cupcakes to your customers from France. That is quite an honor. <laughs> they, they loved it. They loved it. The carrot was a big hit too. Excellent. So, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna start with with the, just a discussion, so you can share more about your story, uh, and then we'll have Q and A beginning at around uh, twenty minutes of the hour, so one forty for us here in the East Coast. So so let's start with your career path. You began in finance, and what inspired you to take the leap from business to baking? So I grew up in a family that really believed in traditional education. And not an entrepreneurial family at all. My dad was a corporate lawyer, very risk averse, in fact. And I was brought up to believe that you just followed a certain path and you stair-stepped your way to success. So that's what I was planning to do. I graduated college. I was recruited into an investment bank. It was the late 90s in San Francisco at the time. Then I went to work for a technology company called Snap.com, not Snapchat, Snap.com. And then life served me sort of a one-two punch. As I'm sure so many of you know, the dot-com bust <laughs> was the first of them. And all of a sudden, I had been doing all the right things, and I was out of a job. And I, I just looked around, and I thought, wait, this wasn't supposed to happen. And then not long after that, 9-11, that great uh, national tragedy happened. And it left me reeling and really made me think for the first time ever about what it was I actually wanted to do in this world. You know, traumatic events can be quite clarifying in that way. And I realized I didn't love what I'd been doing. And I wanted to do something that brought me more joy. I wanted to do something that injected a little more meaning back into the world, even if it was a slice of cake. And so I took a really sharp left turn. Instead of going to business school, I decided to enroll in pastry school. And what I found was I loved working with my hands. I loved getting in that kitchen every day and, you know, making beautiful, delicious creations and something tangible that I could hand to someone and watch them enjoy. It just was really rewarding. I, I loved it in the book. You called it your cupcake MBA. That was, uh, <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> so what gave you the confidence to, to start, launch your first store? And how did you know there was a market? Well, I didn't know there was a market just yet. When I graduated pastry school, I wanted to be as creative as possible because I hadn't exercised that part of my brain at all. So I started by just making these custom layered multi-tiered cakes out of my house. And they were definitely creative, but they were also kind of a nightmare. They took me days to make. And then, of course, I was trying to deliver them in San Francisco up those like really steep hills. And I could hear the decorations falling off as I was delivering them. And I just thought, oh, my God. Not to mention, this wasn't really a great business idea because special occasion cakes are reserved for special occasions. And I decided I needed to sell something that people could conceivably eat or buy every day. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, I remember walking through the supermarket and seeing all of these like shelf stable cupcakes 
stacked in plastic clamshells sitting there, like, you know, totally unappealing. And I thought, wow, the cupcake really needs a makeover. And at the time, you know, they were sort of an afterthought. They really were just still a kid's treat. Adults love them, but they love them just for the nostalgic, you know, piece of it. They didn't actually love eating this sort of, you know, mix made and shortening laden frosting. And I still don't under understand why a sharp plastic pick was considered a great decorative idea for a kid's treat. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, wow, I could use all the beautiful ingredients, the technique, the care that I've reserved for these special cakes and channel it into the cupcake. And so I became obsessed with reinventing the cupcake. Amazing. 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 And when you, you know, I loved reading the stories about some of the celebrities that loved your cupcakes. I know Tyra Banks was one of the first. And then I heard that Katie Holmes, or I read that Katie Holmes loved the cupcakes. And then Tom Cruise bought them and loved hearing about Blake Lively and, uh, and Oprah. So um, can you share some more about those early stories? They're, they're a lot of fun. And, and how did they, um, what effect did they have on your business? Oh, quite an effect. So I started making these cupcakes out of my house. And I have to say, I didn't get a lot of support from people initially because my idea was if I could reinvent and elevate this cupcake, then I could really just put them on a pedestal and devote a bakery just to them, the first ever cupcakes only bakery. And the market in San Francisco was still kind of reeling from the dot-com bust. So I moved down to Los Angeles with my husband, was newly married. And I started baking these cupcakes out of my kitchen. Everybody said it wouldn't work because for a lot of reasons. One, they said people in LA don't eat carbs. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> um, secondly, for cupcakes only bakery, had never been done before. First thing you have to ask yourself is why? And third, it was the height of the low carb craze. I mean, the low carb craze had kind of been around for years at that point. First, it was the Atkins diet. And then I think at that time, the South Beach diet was, you know, top of the New York Times bestseller list. So for all these reasons and more, people thought I had lost my marbles. But I started to get some traction, even just making these cupcakes out of my little West Hollywood apartment. First, it was friends who felt sorry for me, of course. <laughs> And then it was friends of theirs. And sure enough, I was getting calls, you know, from people that I couldn't trace how they'd gotten my number. And one of those calls was indeed from the producer of the Tyra Banks show. She wanted to give Tyra my cupcakes for her 30th birthday. So at that point, I was like, okay, I'm <laughs> onto something here. I'm onto something. People in LA actually do eat carbs. They aren't robots. And they'll do it if it's a splurge worthy and craveable product, which I had spent, you know, a couple of years at that point developing. Um, so when we finally opened our doors, I had this small, but very devoted following that I built from word of mouth, from just having a great product. And, uh, I remember the first time that that word of mouth reached the small screen, my phone started blowing up. And one of my friends said, did you see it? Did you see it? And I said, what are you talking about? They said, on TV. I go, I don't have time to watch TV. I just opened a small business. They said, Katie Holmes is talking about your cupcakes during her press junket for some movie she was doing. And she was on Entertainment Tonight or one of those entertainment shows. She said that Sprinkles was her favorite new little secret find in Beverly Hills. Well, that was exciting enough. But add to that the fact that then Tom Cruise started courting her. So I don't know if everyone out there remembers, but it was Tom Cat Fever. He was jumping on the couch at Oprah, talking about how in love he was. And all of the media in LA were going wild. They all wanted to get the interview with these two. They were the media darlings. And what they ended up doing is they knew that Katie loved sprinkles. So they bring sprinkles to the red carpet and used it as bait to get interviews. <laughs> So we were somehow this new little business and our cupcakes were in the middle of the most incredible media fever ever. And then um, that kind of got us started. And then we finally got through our first holiday season, which was nuts because there's a really, really big, I mean, holiday gifting, of course, is a big deal anyway. But in the entertainment world, there's a really, really strong culture of gift giving. And we were the gift to give on everyone's list that year, including Tom and Katie's. So my husband and I had finally gotten through this holiday season. We thought we were about to die. We were actually looking forward to a slow January where everyone would be on their New Year's cleanses. 
And it was actually a slow day. We were you know, cleaning up early. We'd turn the ovens off. We we're going to send our team home early for once that day. And the phone rings and it says Harpo Studios on the caller ID. I didn't think anything of it because they had a, an office in Santa Monica and they would order cupcakes all the time. But there was a producer on the other line and she said, you know, Oprah loves your cupcakes. And after I pretty much collapsed and then gathered myself again, I said, really? She does? And they said, yes, she'd love some. And I said, great. How can we get them to her? And she said, well, she'd actually love 350 of them in Chicago for her studio audience tomorrow morning. And I had no idea how I was going to do that. But I said, no problem. And I hung up the phone. I yelled back, fire up the ovens. I baked and frosted those cupcakes, stacked them up into shopping bags, went through TSA, which is already annoying enough, like put a <laughs> box to the x-ray machine and got her on a red eye with nothing but those cupcakes and the clothes Amazing. on my back. And the next morning, my husband came with me and um, we were backstage at the Oprah Winfrey show. All of a sudden, the servers come out delivering these cupcakes to the studio audience. And Oprah Winfrey just delivered this love letter to our cupcakes. And it was just unbelievable. And when that show aired two weeks later, we were still one tiny little bakery in Beverly Hills and we became an international brand overnight. So incredible. And you talk a lot about your husband, Charles, and I love how you describe how you met him in investment banking. And you said he wasn't like all the other investment bankers. <laughs> He um he he knew the garage attendants' names. Yay. He knew their families. He was collaborative, and and I could see why you fell in love with him. Yeah. And as a as a co-founder, it's different, right, to work with yeah. you. And so, what was that experience like? And um, when you think about a co-founder, and a lot of startups have co-founders, mm -hmm. what what do you look for in a co-founder? Yes, most of my friends could never imagine working with their husbands, but you brought up a good point. We actually met working together. We were not dating at the time, but um, we worked late nights, putting together pitch books, high stress situations. So I knew if we could work that hard under that much duress working for someone else, we could certainly do it working for ourselves. I think the key too is, and we had no choice because the moment we opened, we were just we were basically drinking from a fire hose. We didn't know what hit us. The demand was insane and we weren't ready. So we very quickly had to choose a lane. Um, at any startup, resources are scarce. And so that's just a good idea anyway. And so I think finding a co-founder who has that same work ethic as you mm -hmm. and is willing to put in the hours and the intensity and match your intensity, but with a complementary skill set is really the way to go. Mm -hmm. That that's that's awesome, um, and talk about the steps you took to sell your first cupcake. Oh well, you know, for me, I knew that if I was going to be betting my life savings and my reputation, mind you, on on cupcakes, it had to be an exceptional product. So I spent a couple years just recipe developing. My husband and I would sit around our small dining room table and taste batches and batches of cupcakes, scribbling little notes in our notepads, cleansing our palates with water like we were master sommeliers. And, you know, I just knew that the product had to be something that was craveable, that was splurge worthy, and that was surprising. Mm. And so not only was it a great tasting cupcake, but I had to reinvent it from the inside out. If I was going to reinvent the cupcake, it had to be holistic. So I really thought long and hard about the brand and what that cupcake would look like and what every element of it would sort of um, signal as to what was inside. So the everything from the chocolate brown wrapper, which felt more elegant than those pastel wrappers of the time, to the frosting, which was hand frosted with an offset spatula, as opposed to the piping bag aesthetic of the time that felt a little bit more factory production line. And then I also reinvented the traditional sprinkle itself into a more modern and punchy graphic decoration, which we call the modern dot. And all of this spoke to the fact that this was a new type of cupcake. This was a very special uh, treat and something that you had never experienced before. Absolutely. And bootstrapping uh, or investor capital, uh, as far as funding goes, what did you what did you choose to do? Charles and I chose to bootstrap, but I I, I use the term chose loosely because there certainly wasn't 
we'd come from that world and we knew there was not an investor out there who would have bet any amount of money on two out of work investment bankers who were looking to bet it all on cupcakes at the height of the low carb craze. So we pulled our resources from the few years we'd spent working in the career world and gave ourselves that amount of time. We had a certain amount of money and we lived very modestly during those few years. And there were some really scary times where it took us a long time to find a location money was running out and I didn't know if we were going to be able to do it. So um, we sacrificed and we bootstrapped. And then of course, once we opened and we had lines out the door, all these investors came running, you know, they all wanted to invest then. And at that point we said, no, no, we're the ones that took the risk. You know, we bet everything on this. Now we're going and, mm -hmm. and we got this. And so it wasn't until eight years later when we brought in a strategic partner and sold the majority stake in Sprinkles that that we took any investment. That's great. And it, if we talk a little bit more about the aesthetic, I love the modern dot. It, 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 uh, it's so it's so cool to, to nibble on on the top of the cupcake. And I remember in the book um, you, you talked about someone tried to replicate it. And so this, mm. you know, in, in one of the, the other restaurants, how did it come to be? Because um, I know you were had pretty fancy toppings before, right? And then when you're yeah. scaling this, it's different. So how did that come to be and, and, and uh, share the importance of that? Well, I knew that in reinventing the cupcake, I had to do that from the inside out. And that included the sprinkle. I also knew that I was betting my life savings and a lot of years of my life on a business that was ultimately not very defensible. Um, you know, anyone can make a cupcake. And when I say anyone, I mean, most children can make a cupcake. And here I was, you know, putting all of this time and all of this money into something that anyone could basically just rip off. So I thought really long and hard about how I was going to defend my brand. If I was successful, which we were, and and competition followed, which it did quickly mm -hmm. and spread like wildfire, what was I going to do about that? How could I defend my product and my company? And I really just had to lean into brand. And that modern dot ended up being the only intellectual property that I could protect. That modern dot became synonymous with our cupcakes. We applied for trademark protection because we really, Charles and I were bringing this you know, thought process from our days in technology and finance. Not a lot of people think about intellectual property when they think about baked goods, right? But um, we did, and we were able to trademark that dot, which was really important to us because as I said, that market for cupcakes just exploded. And every day there was a new cupcake shop popping up across the country. I mean, across the world, Paris, France had their own cupcake bakery <laughs> as well. And they all looked an awful lot like ours. So there was a lot of market confusion. So just to have that one piece of intellectual property that we really could use to defend our brand and the goodwill we had created in the market was really important. Mm -hmm. And when you think about scaling beyond the first store. Um, how, how, what, how did you think about that? And when did you make that decision? And what kinds of scaling issues did you face? Mm, so many. <laughs> <laughs> I always imagined Sprinkles would be a national brand. I thought, of course, everybody needs a cupcake shop in their town. I mean, every, you know, people celebrate birthdays. There's always an occasion for a cupcake. So even with one little store, I imagine sprinkles across the country. Now, it took us a little while to get our operations in order. Charles and I, listen, we were two kids with a dream, and neither one of us had actually worked in a restaurant or a bakery or managed a retail store before. So we were learning on the job, and the amount of demand that was coming at us didn't really give us much time to learn. Um, so we were drinking from a fire hose from day one, and it took us a while to get our operations in shape, to be able to staff up and, and really formalize any sort of structure at our business. Um, so it took us a while to start scaling. And then once we did scale, you know, we really had to go and stake our claim across the country because the market was becoming so mm. crowded so quickly. So what we were doing was quite difficult for a restaurant. We were basically picking up and moving to a, a totally different market, having to hire a whole new team. And there were no, there were no benefits to scaling in one area at all. We mm. had to bake from scratch 
and each location. Um, so that was really difficult. And then, of course, baking is a little bit of science. It's a lot of science. So when we would open in a new market like a Scottsdale, for example, which was really dry and very unkind to bake goods, we had to readjust recipes on the fly to kind of infuse more moisture. In fact, the cupcakes hmm. were getting so dry in Scottsdale that we had customers coming in and not wanting to buy more than one or two at a time because they were worried they would dry out. Huh. Sprinkle's business model is based on, we're only selling one thing. It's based on people buying at quantity. People would usually come in and buy one or two dozen. So we had to quick come up with this you know, uh, custom Ziploc bag that would hold do a dozen cupcakes in place and keep them sealed and fresh so we could continue to, you know, encourage people to buy a quantity. Oh my gosh. And I, that, that's so, because my, my carrot muff cupcake was so moist. <laughs> the, the walnuts, it, it, it tasted like a cousin, uh, my cousin's carrot cake. I honestly, oh, good. I'm, glad, I'm glad you focused on quality. <laughs> and you talk a little bit about culture in the book. You talk about hiring, but when you first thought about culture, how did you approach it? What kind of culture did you want to create? Well, I knew I wanted one that was the antithesis of what I'd experienced in investment banking. Let's just start there. Yeah. I think I made a lot of mistakes when it came to hiring. The first hire I made was 100% based on experience over attitude. I looked at this person's resume and I saw a bakery on the resume and I thought, oh, thank God, someone who knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? But that didn't give me and my husband enough credit for the fact that we were bringing our own unique culture to this bakery. And we weren't really wanting to borrow from other um, businesses' cultures. But what's so funny is this, this young man who I hired early on who I was, I was just desperate for help. He had this bakery on his resume and I thought, perfection, let's set him to work. I hired him on the spot. And then I noticed that he just, his style was not right. It was a little sarcastic. It wasn't that sprinkles ethos of injecting joy and delight. And what I learned along the way was it was so much more important to hire for attitude and enthusiasm mm. over experience. And that we really brought this own, our own special, unique culture mm -hmm. um, to this new business, and and we had to build our team from the ground up. Absolutely, you you mentioned mistakes. So thinking back, looking back on on what you accomplished, and and I know mistakes are learning and and it's progress, right? But um, mm, what are what are the uh, mistakes that you some of the mistakes you made, and would you do anything differently? Hmm. Well, as I said in the early days, our production was a disaster. I think they always say hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. But I think I should have been a little bit more prepared for a good case scenario. I mean, my I was still working out of these tiny mixers, making one to two dozen, yielding one to two dozen out of each recipe. And as I said, people were coming and buying one to two dozen at a time. So we constantly had a line out the door and our cupcake case was always bare. And our customers were uh, understandably very upset with us. I remember one woman coming in and yelling at us and saying that we were incompetent and that we would surely shut down soon. And I just spent all day sort of baking as fast as I could and sweating and apologizing to customers. I think I would have been more prepared in terms of hiring a team to you know, be ready. That was maybe uh, like ready to go from, from day one. And we were just a deer in headlights. It took us too long. And I also think that I was held back by perfectionism. For some reason, I thought I was the only one who could bake and frost a sprinkles cupcake. Yeah. Now I knew that, you know, the difference between a memorable cupcake and a not so memorable cupcake is really just a few things. It's very nuanced. So I wanted to make sure to, to nail those nuances and make sure there was an exceptional product going out the door. But I almost killed myself doing it. My husband and I spent nights on the bakery floor sometimes. We were so exhausted. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And so you, you mentioned the brand. And um, and you, in the book, you also talk about naming. Because you said you could have called it Candace's Cupcakes. Mm. So talk a bit about the brand and then your role in the brand. Sure, of course. So I could have named it Candace's Cupcakes. I love the alliteration there. But I wanted the brand to be much bigger than me. This wasn't about an ego trip. Um, although I did end up stepping into my own personal brand to amplify the company brand along the way. 
it wasn't long after we opened, maybe a few years in, and you know, cupcake shops were popping up everywhere. And there was a bakery from New York that opened just a block away from us in Beverly Hills, which mm -hmm. fine, I understand, bring it on competition, but like a block away, that's a little yeah. rude. So yeah. anyway, all of our customers, I didn't have to be up in arms about it. All of our customers who are so loyal to us, we built this amazing brand where you know our customers had this emotional connection with us. They were irate. So I had, there was a producer driving down Little Santa Monica Boulevard one day. She passed our cupcake store with the line at the door. And then she passed a block later at this other bakery. And she said, well, it's a goddamn cupcake war out there. <laughs> and ding, ding, ding. That was the name for her new show. She oh. went to Food Network. She sold the show on name alone. And then they came and asked me to be a judge on the show as I was the queen of cupcakes. And I was a little hesitant at first. I mean, I was really busy operationally in my business, but I realized that in building a national brand, the ability to come into people's living rooms every week and establish myself as one of the leaders in cupcakes and have that our brand name in everyone's living room every week was just too big of an opportunity to pass up. And so stepping into that role as a TV personality really, really did help to amplify our brand nationally and beyond. And, and I think in the book you mentioned you were you took acting lessons. Was it at college? That that's could because you're really doing that. Like you're very comfortable in front of the camera, and and you know that that that's the history you have and experience. Did that help you uh, in any way? It, it's funny that that you notice that. I think about that sometimes because I think a lot of times when we're going along in our journey, we think we got to find the one thing, and we don't give enough credit to the things that didn't necessarily pan out or maybe we didn't pursue. And so they didn't give us anything. They didn't teach us anything, but everything happens for a reason. And I do think that that time I spent on stages in high school and in college definitely gave me the confidence to be able to, although it's different, sit in front of a camera and be a face. Yeah. Well, our two daughters love Cupcake War. So when I told uh, them I was going to be doing this, they're like, oh my gosh, mom, <laughs> <how> amazing. <laughs> so, tell them hi for me. I will. I will. <laughs> I will. So I also love the story about the cu the cupcake ATM and the idea mm -hmm. of it. You were pregnant and you wanted the chocolate cupcake. If you want to share that, I think it's awesome. Of course. So much about entrepreneurship is, I think, leaning into frustration. I mean, just even back in our finance days when it was someone's birthday and we'd get a cake and everyone was running around trying to find plates and forks and knives and inevitably, you know, you got carrot and someone didn't like carrot. <laughs> and I thought, here's another reason to love cupcakes, right? Everyone can get their favorite flavor. You don't need forks and knives. They're portable, personalized. But with the cupcake ATM, again, that was leaning into a frustration whereby I was pregnant with my second son. I had just come back from a party with my husband. It was late. There were no cupcakes at the house. The bakery was closed. And I had to have a dark chocolate cupcake. I mean, the dark chocolate cupcakes got me through both of my pregnancies. There were none to be found. And I just started kind of grumbling about it. And because my husband and I like to say we embrace the crazy ideas, we embrace this sort of what if thinking, instead of just going to bed and forgetting about it, we started batting around this idea of like, what if you could get a cupcake anytime, day or night? What would that look like? And it kind of makes sense because we pay rent 24 hours a day. And so that was what led to the cupcake ATM. Oh, and our daughter went to school in her friend with her uh, in New York and she and her friends loved it. So, <laughs> so cool. And um, we'll probably spend, let's see, maybe five more minutes and then we can pop up the questions um, because I know you're off to a keynote pretty soon. So uh, what learnings did you have at, uh, you know, from your experience with Sprinkles that you then brought to Pizzana? Mm -hmm. So Pizzana, as you so wonderfully introduced, is my new concept. It's a new Neapolitan uh, pizza concept. Very delicious. And plug, you can uh, get them shipped to you on Gold Belly. But um, one, one of the things I brought to me was the fact that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Both Sprinkles and Pizzana are just modern updates on something that is a classic that people already loved. And just sort of elevating those foods and surprising and delighting people with foods they thought they knew in new ways. Um, and then just the power of brand, really. I mean, Sprinkles was able to scale the majority of its locations through um, the Great Recession. 
Mm. They were, I like to say the, if you've heard of the lipstick phenomenon, they were the lipstick of the great recession. People really turned to them in a market downturn to be that injection of joy, to be that affordable luxury that got them through a hard time. And we really saw the same thing at Pizzana throughout the pandemic. People turned to us sometimes three times a week to be their pizza delivery, to be feed their family during a really challenging time where moms were trying to do it all. And so they just couldn't get dinner on the table as well. And so building that trust, that emotional connection, that strong brand whereby you have this loyalty so that when times are tough, when you have a slip up maybe that where you do kind of fall down on the job for a second, or even during a you know, sustained market downturn, people are still turning to you. Yeah, absolutely. And and you you um, talk about innovation in, in the book as well and how you innovated in unique ways. Mm -hmm. And um, what are the some of the ways you innovated? Well, Sprinkles, uh, first and foremost, was innovative in that it was the first ever cupcakes only upscale cupcake, but also cupcakes only bakery. And so, you know, Charles and I like to think of ourselves as innovators, even though we work in food, we really bring um, this lens of innovation to everything we do. Obviously, you know, disrupting the bakery landscape by being the first and then coming out with the first ever cupcake ATM at Pizzana. You know, we worked so long and hard on this incredible product that we actually didn't do pizza takeout for the first year because we weren't sure that our product would translate when it was coming out of a cardboard box. Box. Hmm. So we had to come up with a new system, which was this innovative system we call heat and slice. Okay. We will cook off your pizza in the restaurant. We won't slice it. We'll put all of the fresh toppings on the side. <clears throat> and then when you get the pizza at your house, you fire it off in your oven at 500 degrees. You put the fresh toppings on and you cut it up and serve it. And it is like 99% of the experience of what you would get in the restaurant. So we're always thinking outside the box. We're always trying to add value. And I think it's just a mindset that you have to have. Yeah. And I think in, you also talked about investing up front um, when you launched the stores, mm -hmm. the best ovens. And some people said, oh, get a used mm -hmm. one. Uh, the best system to take orders. I mean, because you knew you wanted to grow it. Mm -hmm. Very innovative all, all the way through. I think we'll take our, we have a few questions in the queue. If we want to put them up on the screen, we can we can go there. Um, and I, I do love how you met the, the uh, how you met your chef, uh, executive chef for Pizzana at a party. And then you decided to do this. That, that's a cool thing. Okay, so here's a question from uh, the team. Did cupcake competitions scare you? Mm, great question. I don't know that scare is the right word. I do think it motivated me. I think it lit a fire under me to keep delivering consistently every day, you know, setting this high standard and living up to that standard. And also thinking about how am I going to keep moving the needle? How am I going to keep disrupting? And, you know, as I said, Sprinkles was innovative initially, but then in a sea of competition, we were just one in the pack all of a sudden. And I looked out at the sea of competition. I thought, we got to do it again. What are we going to do? And that's when we came out with the Cupcake ATM. Oh, I love it. And I know we have a couple other questions that'll pop up on our screen here. One from Lauren. You talked about not having res restaurant experience or retail experience. How did you learn that? Trial and error? Small business orgs, mentors, others? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was a woman in town. She was the mother of a friend of mine. She had a small bakery on mm. Pico Boulevard. And she was my mentor. Mm. We would go, my, hus uh, my husband Charles and I would go by and sit down in her bakery when things were slow, eat her chocolate chip cookies, drink milk. And she would tell us about what equipment we needed to buy and you know how to find staff and, and how to schedule them. We went to a bakery conference in Las Vegas, which I talk about in the book and actually was quite humbling because everyone thought we were such noobs, which we were, but they thought we were doing everything wrong. We were buying new equipment. We just were so naive. We didn't need more than a, I mean, this will date me, but we didn't need more than a cash register. We didn't need to spend on a big fancy POS. But as you said, Patty, we were building a foundation for a larger business. Mm -hmm. And that was really important to us. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't 
meet our vision if we were just getting by on a cash register and used equipment. I mean, at the end of the day, what do you really need most at a cupcake shop is a working oven. So we said we will gladly pay for extra, you know, warranties and, you know, the extra price that comes with the fancy new machinery. Yeah, what, did, what did you talk about also? The air conditioning is essential. Oh, yes. Basics. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. so true. Operations in the restaurant, you know, we spend so much time on the details and the menu and the experience, but at the end of the day, if your AC is on the fritz, no one's showing up. So don't forget the very basic operational details. Absolutely. Uh, I think we have another question. And for those of you on the call, feel free to ask, uh, enter your questions. We'd love to hear from you. How I did you figure out the icing to cake ratio? Oh, I love the icing. The, the, the top of it and how it overlaps on the sides. And it's <laughs> flat. I, I, I was overwhelmed how, how great it was. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier how in reinventing the cupcake, it didn't stop at the recipe and the ingredients. It really sort of extended to the entire experience. And that includes the icing and, and how it was frosted. So the sort of icing style of the day was this piping bag, this swirl, kind of looked like, you know, a soft serve ice cream cone. And I wanted to do something different because part of the problem with that is all of the icing is piled up in the middle. And sometimes the, the outside of the cupcake is quite bare. Yeah, but yeah. I like having, people have different ideas of what's a perfect icing to cake ratio. But what I think everyone can agree on is that you should have the same icing to cake ratio throughout. And so using this offset spatula not only gave this cupcake a more artisanal look, which signaled what it was they were about to enjoy, the customer was about to enjoy, but it also allowed for the same amount of frosting across the cupcake. So that was really important. But in the early days, and, and I don't believe Sprinkles sells these any longer, but in the early days, we also had little frosting shots. So if you really were a frosting person and you wanted to squeeze a little bit more on, you have that option. Oh my goodness, that sounds great. I think they should have those again. <laughs> um, any more questions here? I think that might be the last one. Let me just, um, let me ask one more and then maybe you could think about any thoughts you'd like to leave us with. Balance, juggling, work, mm. and family. You have two boys, is that right? Mm, yes. Um, you and Charles, both in the same business, both mm. you know, doing similar things at similar times. How did you juggle? Mm. Well, one of the most beautiful things about having a partner, the same partner in life and work is that yeah. you really have each other's back because in theory, ideally, and we do have the same goals overall for our priorities, we are aligned um, across the board. And so if somebody had to be somewhere, at, you know, at an important meeting and one of our kids got sick, it, it was good because we worked it out. And I think also this idea of balance, people, this is top of mind these days. And I find the word a little bit triggering only because when you are trying to birth something into the world, whether it's a book or a show or a company, what have you, that takes a Herculean amount of effort. That takes more hours than the day even offers. And so Having to think about in the back of your head, am I feeling balanced right now? Adds actually another layer of guilt and yeah. and sort of heaviness to the situation. I like to think of it as balance over time. Mm. You know, I, I there have been plenty of nights where I have been filming late or at a restaurant opening and I haven't seen my kids all day. I didn't get a chance to send them to school. I didn't get a chance to say goodnight before they went to sleep. Those days are really hard. Yeah. But the last thing I want to be also layering on top of that is I don't feel balanced. What I always give myself grace for is that some things take more time, but I'm going to get it back on the other side. And when this show is over, when this restaurant opening is over, I am going to pour into my kids in a way that you know, I haven't been able to. And so I just like to think of balance more as over a period of time, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And you're, you're an incredible role model for them and for, for all of us. Thank so you. What are the, some last thoughts that you'd like to, oh, actually there's another audience question. So if we pop that up and then we'll think about some parting thoughts, cause I know you got to get to the uh, keynote. At what point did you move out of the house and the operations you had in your house to an actual bakery. 
And how did you know that the time was right to do that? Hmm. So I would say from the time I started really working on recipe de development until we opened our doors was about two years. But I would have liked for it to have been sooner. It's just, it hmm. took us a really long time to find a location. It was a tight real estate market at the time. And we had no former experience. So we weren't really ideal tenants for a lot of these landlords. I mean, honestly, one of them hung up on me. He was like, this is not, this is, he thought it was a joke, my idea. So it took us a while to find that location. And once we did, we had to spend a lot of time renovating it to create this vision that we had. In terms of knowing it was the right time, I had gotten that little bit of traction out of my house. I was getting a little bit of buzz sort of from a, from a small but devoted following of tastemakers. I didn't know for sure. Every, you know, sort of entrepreneurial venture involves some risk, but I had just enough traction to sort of verify my gut feeling that there might be something there. And I did think a little bit first about, okay, maybe I should sell at farmer's markets first, or maybe we should do a little pop-up. But I also felt that there was an opportunity and maybe the window was closing. Cupcakes were kind of starting to be trending, as I said, on the wedding scene and more. And I thought if I moved too slowly, somebody might leapfrog me to the store and, and take that idea and run with it. Perfect. Well, any parting thoughts or um, suggestions, advice for those budding entrepreneurs out there? Well, you know, it's so ironic because I'm talking to an audience at Google, but technology has always really intimidated me. And I think one of the reasons one of the inspirations for writing this book is really to inspire that next generation of entrepreneurs and to allow for the fact that entrepreneurship is a spectrum. Obviously, those you know high growth technology companies get all of the attention because they are building our future. But I built a really big business out of something simple and something anyone could do. And yeah. so I want to encourage people to really think about entrepreneurship as, as a path. It's, it's been so fulfilling to me and, and I really do think it represents the future and change. And it's wonderful that it was your passion too in an area that you loved. So thank you for being with us today. It was such an honor to be here with you and um, we'll keep following your, your book and, and it's a great holiday gift, everyone. Uh, I, I actually have the book and Kindle and the Audible version because I just was taking it with me wherever I went. So uh, thank you th so much, Candace, and good luck with your keynote. And we'll, we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Take care. Bye.